Don't you just love the concept of a maker space? I like to picture a sunlit loft filled with art supplies, pieces of wood, workbenches, computers, cozy overstuffed armchairs, and live edge counters with high yellow stools. Maybe some George Winston playing piano through a speaker, a 3D printer humming in the background. Wait, do they hum? I've never actually seen one. Also, a box of rainbow sprinkled donuts over by the fountain. Yes, in my dream maker space, there's definitely a fountain. Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, Betsy, but remember how this podcast is generally focused on ELA teachers? Don't worry, I remember. STEAM and ELA don't have to be divided on this one. A makerspace is just as wonderful for crafting characters, building antagonists, constructing opinions, storyboarding arguments, and doodling moods as it is for building trash-compacting robots and electric engines. If you've been hanging out for long, you probably already know how much I love the concept of the writing makerspace. And hopefully you've already heard the podcast episode, The Power of the Writing Makerspace, when I got to interview Angela Stockman, writing makerspace inventor and pioneer. I'll definitely be linking to it in the show notes if you haven't listened in yet. But today I wanted to really break it down so it feels doable, because it is, and help you feel like you can start with it right away, because you can. So let's do it. Before we dive into episode 125, I want to tell you about something exciting coming your way this summer. Have you been hearing all the buzz about hexagonal thinking and want to join in? Or maybe you've dabbled a bit, but just don't quite have your head wrapped around the concept? I'm now taking signups for my free summer series, Camp Creative, Master Hexagonal Thinking in 5 Minutes a Day. Whether you want to put hexagonal thinking into action in your classroom for the first time or amplify its power for your students, this one's for you. You'll learn how to introduce the concept, different ways to create your hexagonal thinking decks, and exactly what to put on your cards, how to help students deepen the connections they make, and how to assess and build on your hexagonal thinking activities. I've been hearing success stories on the daily about this creative discussion igniting strategy, and I can't wait to give you the tools, knowledge, and resources that you need to hit the ground running with it come fall. You'll find the link to sign up in the show notes today over at www.nowsparkcreativity.com. I can't wait to work with you during this free summer session. And now on to the show. Okay, so let's start with the basics. What do you need to start a writing maker space? Well, that's really up to you. You could get started with a big stack of post-its you got at a rummage sale and some empty wall space. You could get started by painting that old table no one's using in the back of the storage room with chalkboard paint and pushing it into one corner of your classroom. Your maker space can look like a Pinterest-worthy Reggio Emilia-inspired mini studio in your classroom, or it could look like a plastic bin with some stuff in it. The point is just to start. Do a writing makerspace project with your students, see what's working, and go from there. You do not need to spend a lot of money. Here's a list of things you could put in your makerspace, but definitely don't need. You could have chalk, chalkboard paint, surfaces that you can chalk on. You could have whiteboard markers, whiteboard paint, surfaces you can expo on. You could have bulletin boards with push pins and papers. You could have notebooks, sketchbooks, post-its, scraps of craft paper, contact paper. You could have scotch tape, washi tape, masking tape, duct tape. You could have glue sticks, glue, glitter glue, a glue gun. You could have loose parts like beads, blocks, little pretty pieces of glass like you see in fish tanks, Legos, screws, bolts, wood, cardboard. You could have mark makers, pens, pencils, markers, crayons, watercolors, paint jars, highlighters. You could have natural parts like rocks, shells, sticks, or driftwood. You could have things that kind of moosh around like clay, Play-Doh, or slime. One thing that will really help is to have some kind of organizational plan as you build up a few of these materials. That could be a bookshelf you pick up from the front of someone's house with a little free sign on it, a rolling cart you got on Facebook Marketplace, or just a big bin with a lot of shoe boxes you can pull out on Writing Makerspace Day. Some kind of labeling system, some kind of box or basket system will be your friend. 
You're going to want to help your students to keep your materials and their work sorted in some way so that you're not always cleaning up your writing maker space. So think about how much you want to make available on any given day. If you gather a lot of this stuff, that doesn't mean students always have to use a lot. Maybe you just want to make post-its and markers available one day, or maybe you just want to make beads and bolts available. You also want to think about whether students are going to build their little item and then snap a photo of it and put it back, or they're going to keep it as they work through their project. I think the easiest is definitely to put something together, build it, and then um, either doodle it into their notebook or snap a photo and put it back. All right, so you have your materials. Remember, it doesn't have to be a lot. You have some place to keep them and some kind of a plan for how students are going to pull the materials out and put the materials back. Um, if you're feeling nervous about building up your materials, I want to tell you that in the show notes today, I have a little letter that you can send home or share with people around your school that just kind of invites them to donate old art supplies or loose parts to your new writing maker space. So if you think it would be fun, you can go to the show notes over at www.houseparkcreativity.com and you can print that out straight from Google Drive. I just have a link there. It's kind of a cute little letter um, describing what a writing maker space is and also the kinds of things that would be helpful if people have them laying around. I am getting ready to move right now and I could probably fill your writing maker space <laughs> with stuff from my playroom that I can't bring with me to Bratislava. So if you know people who are moving or you know you can go to a local community rummage sale or something, I think you can pick up so much stuff for a maker space without spending much, if any, money. So once you have your materials, what are some ways to get started? Here are some like really simple assignments you could get started with. Maybe you're about to do a short story project. You could have your students pull out some materials and create a character or build an antagonist for their story. Maybe you're working on realistic dialogue. You could have every student quickly make a puppet and then ask them to get with a partner and have their puppets ask each other questions and start to write down the dialogue. Maybe you're going to be working on opinion. You could have them take out a piece of paper and a stack of post-its and just cover the paper and possible ideas to support their opinion and then start moving them around into a more logical sequence and adding more post-its with sort of umbrella statements that go with all the little ideas on the, on the first round of post-its. Once you get started with the writing makerspace, you can kind of see that no matter what type of writing you're working on, having students build or create, make something before they get going just sort of helps them to shape their ideas, helps them brainstorm, helps them start to create a flow before they even get started with pen on paper. And for many writers who find writing intimidating or experience some form of writer's block, this type of making can be super duper helpful. Now, let's say a lot of your students are still online or you just really like to skip over this business of gathering materials. Another option would be to create a digital maker space. This could be um, a way to warm up to it if you're feeling nervous about having loose parts in your classroom. I've been experimenting with setting up a digital maker space as an option and I've enjoyed it. I use the online program Canva to create a little classroom. So I put in a photo of kind of a blank office and then I started adding things in one area. I added some blocks, I added a chalkboard, I added a whiteboard, I added little pieces of paper taped to the wall with washi tape. I just added all these different things that I would want to give students if I actually had the things <laughs> in a physical space. And then I linked so that when students clicked on say the blocks, then they go to a slide that has a bunch of colorful shapes and it says, you know, build your concept with these idea blocks and they can move the blocks around and there's text attached to the blocks. And so once they have an idea built, if they want to, they can start typing in sort of the different components of the idea and show why it's built the way it's built. And I put a little example slide 
under the blank slide. So when they click on the blocks, they automatically get a fresh copy of the idea blocks and they can start to play around with it. Or if they click on the whiteboard, then they're made an individual copy of a blank whiteboard with some colorful um, text on there and they can move the text around and type things in or they can pull images to put onto the whiteboard. Um, and same for the chalkboard, the bulletin board, the papers. Each little click just takes them to a new batch of materials. And of course, it's all free. <laughs> it's all extremely clean. If you have found that your students have become really comfortable with a program like Google Slides over the course of this year of distance learning, and you think that they could make on the computer, that could be a cool option. It could also be something that you just always have available for kids who are more into um, graphic design and less into um, sort of physical making. So it could just be like one asset in your maker space. Okay, so let's review. All I wanted to do today was just sort of introduce you to this concept, how easy it is to get going with a writing makerspace project. So you just start with a few tools. If you want to start building more up, you can use the free letter in the show notes today. You can just print it straight off my website. You do not need to break the bank to help students start making writing and prototyping ideas. And then coming later, probably next show or in two shows, we'll talk about five specific ways that you can use your writing maker space once you get it set up and you've started to experiment a little bit and have a sense for the concept. So I'm excited to share more in the future, but for now, I hope you'll just sort of start to think this over and um, consider gathering a few materials. Thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with a friend, screenshotting it and sharing it to your Insta stories, or smashing that five-star button on your podcast player. I'd love to have your help in my quest to help more English teachers on their creative journeys. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative.